Well, it's a pleasure to join you today at the TJ AI Forum. Um, I thought I'd start with the foundations. I define AI as the study of mechanisms underlying thought and intelligent behavior. Now, the founders of the field, uh, in the first document that used the phrase artificial intelligence, said they were trying to find how to make machines solve the kinds of problems now reserved for humans, back in 1955. So I partition AI efforts into three central pillars of effort. First, on the scientific and experimental foundations where we do research on principles and mechanisms of AI. Second, on research around the critically important area of interactions between people and AI systems. And third, on the broad area of opportunities and challenges with applications, both the upsides and the risks and downsides. Now, on principles and mechanisms, uh, we've had multiple paradigm shifts over the nearly 70 years of the field. On the latest, we've been riding on top of a fast-moving wave of innovation with deep neural network models for a little over a decade now. I would call this an inflection point with these methods. We've seen fast-paced developments moving from early surprises in speech recognition in 2010 and it's amazing how just in a few years, the benchmarks that have, been, that have been hit reaching parity with humans on multiple benchmarks. The first wave of DNNs, deep neural networks, were focused on pattern recognition in language and vision, such as speech recognition, and image analysis, like this example in radiology. And we've seen base formulations of representation shifting and getting more sophisticated starting with the linear representations of text into the 2D representations of imagery, into more general networks, for example, this protein-protein interaction network used to represent biological functions, interactions of drugs and, and targets, and so on. Research on mastering human AI collaboration has been maturing over 20 years. The way I view this is, is we, we're trying to field methods that that where AI complements human intellect. And this includes coming up with mechanisms that help figure out how to characterize and then weave together both human and machine competencies. And we can use AI for that. For example, figuring out the details on what the weaknesses and strengths of humans and machines are. Uh, and this is like work we did on pathology. Humans are good at certain things, machines are good at others. If we train the machines to understand human weaknesses, we can more ideally weave them together. Now, another area focuses on how AI inputs and engagement should be interleaved with human problem solving. In other words, how do we coordinate user, human being, and AI initiative? Most real-world applications of AI are not one-shot scenarios, like a single prediction or a classification. So there could be a problem-solving dialogue, so to speak. So research in this area includes mechanisms um, for figuring out who goes what and when. In the upper left-hand corner of the screen here is a video of the coordination of initiative between humans and surgical robots in a fast-paced interaction and doing a complex suture. Below that, uh, we see an egocentric video of AI engaging with a user on a task where both are taking turns with their contributions uh, uh, in, in a home situation. And on the right, we, we see um, a, a quick, fast-paced dialogue where there's a team of humans working with a machine, and the system has to time its contributions correctly. Now, moving on to applications, um, particularly those that show great benefits to humanity, there are myriad opportunities to harness today's AI and to aspire to advance the capabilities and influence with the advance of AI. In my mind, critically important opportunities include those in education, medicine, and the broad sciences, but many other areas will benefit as well uh, by insightful applications, including developing uh, regions, um, emerging markets, accessibility, agriculture, and sustainability. These are top of mind for, for me and my team. Now, for the named focus of this meeting on generative AI, there's a recent inflection on the inflection that we're writing on. This is the rise of these methods that are trained in a self-supervised manner 
and that generate rich content. Now, many of these models are trained on a very, very simple task. They're pushed to get better and better at predicting the next word or the next token. But the remarkable behaviors we're seeing from these systems is raising questions about principles and mechanisms. It's stoking research on the left, but it also has major influences on human AI collaboration and AI applications and human flourishing. So one of the earliest huge successes was the GitHub Copilot with generative AI. This system continues to generate guesses of the next portions of programming code that a software engineer uh, needs. GitHub Copilot now plays a significant role in the daily life of millions of software engineers. In one study from Harvard, increasing productivity by over 50%. Now, many folks' first exposure to the richness of, of generative AI came via image synthesis. Now, when Dolly 2 from OpenAI became available, some of the first queries I explored was about visualizing and reflecting on a home project I was doing. I wanted to combine together solar cells for power and solar heating pads to keep a pool warm. Why were these things separate? So I entered this prompt about solar cells affixed to solar heat collectors, um, and I was particularly impressed by the compositional powers of the system to bring together two concepts quite smoothly and realistically. The methods were clearly tools for st stimulating the imagination and perhaps even scientific and engineering imagination, imagining how water might be designed to run through the right piping in solar panels, a system that had never been created before. Now, ideas first tried out in image generation have led and are leading to stunning methods now being used in protein design. Quite amazing work with some protein designs here visualized from the Baker Lab at the University of Washington, a team we've been working very closely with. Now today we're seeing new forms of multimodal models that do generation across both language and imagery, such as Lava Med work from our team here. The work is based on fine tuning a plain language model with tens of millions of figure and caption pairs mined from the literature. You end up with a system that can talk about images and language with great fluidity. But the headline over the last few months has been with the qualitative and quantitative capabilities we're seeing with generative models with scale. Here's the data center where GPT-4 was birthed, just west of Des Moines, Iowa. It provides 10,000 top-level GPUs, 300,000 CPUs, and for the geeks out there, 400 gigabits per second of network connectivity for each GPU server. Now, moving ahead with this investment, which is a significant investment, is based on both a theory of expected powers of scale as well as empirical scaling laws, curves that have been supported by empirical evidence about the predictive powers of the models with the parameters, the size of the data set, and the amount of compute applied. Now, on the scaling laws, here's a prediction of, in, in the dotted line here, of the increasing accuracy of just predicting the next word as a function of context with compute scaling from left to right 10,000 times to GPT-4. Boom. In some ways, we could depend on that prediction because these power laws have been very reliable to date. So Microsoft and OpenAI knew what it was buying in terms of that power of prediction. What we didn't know is that we don't have any understanding right now, we have very little understanding, what we do have the basic metrics, about the emergence of new behaviors. This is what's interesting to us, and it's, it's an interesting area of science right now. A number of studies have demonstrated the commonality of new behaviors emerging quite abruptly when transitioning to more resource-intensive models. Now, moving on to the surprising capabilities with GPT-4, my team gained access to GPT-4 for our close work with OpenAI uh, in, in August of 2022. That was kind of more like GPT-4 base, the original model. Um, and our team got together, and, and we were doing safety studies. That's why we had access to it early with the safety team. But many of us, while safety was important, started experimenting with the system. 
got very excited about possibilities. Uh, two words came to mind for me when I started playing with GPT-4 in August of last year. Phase transition from GPT-3.5 and polymathic. We found a surprising constellation of capabilities. In many ways, we studied the system as a psychologist might study human intellect versus the way a computer scientist uh, studies AI systems. And we cover in this report called Sparks of, 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 of AGI, um, many different capabilities that we, we, we basically got together to explore in a very detailed way. And I re recommend people to look at that paper to see what we had done back in la last fall. We saw the system had ability to do abstraction, generalization, composition of diverse information, and concepts from across multiple disciplines to create new syntheses and ideas. And for those of you who've read that paper, you'll know what that little figure there is means. We were surprised the system could draw. Um, it wasn't necessarily trained on how to draw. It could write code to draw. Um, you could even see in some ways when asked where should the horn go, the system would write code to put the horn in the right place, for example. And we saw a specialty skills showing up, the ability to do data visualization. And it was a general system trained broadly, but it had specialized talents. For example, it did extremely well on the challenging United States medical licensing exam, a jump from GPT-3 and 3.5. You can read about that work uh, on the web. But even more impressively for me, um, when you gave the system input of some of the hardest medical challenges known, the ones featured in a monthly New England journal of here's a really hard medical problem, the system would just breeze through this in an amazing way, hard medical challenges. And this is just a piece of a much longer document. There are also some powerful broad skills that have deep implications for education and pedagogy. We've noted capabilities referred to as theory of mind competencies. That is, the ability to infer mental states of others, beliefs, desires, intentions, and knowledge. What does Alice believe and what does Bob think that, thinks that Alice believes? Capabilities of theory of mind are central to human collaboration, communication, teaching, social interactions, and empathy. And it seems to me, as we do deep dives into theory of mind right now as a, as a focused topic for us, that a lot of this knowledge is implicit and spread across human discourse but the machine is synthesizing and picking up how important this is, even if it's not written about directly. Now, theory of mind was considered back in 2018 to be a grand AI challenge by Science Robotics. It's talked about how important this will be someday. We haven't made good progress on this, but how do we have systems that can have usable models of human mental states? And after our work in our report, which we, I'll show you in a second, we, we, we reported on some examples, uh, Michal Kozinski at, at Stanford uh, came up with a beautiful paper showing how from GPT-3 to GPT-4, um, we've gone and we've increased kind of the age level of the system um, where GPT-4, that he got access to in March, a little few months after we had it, solves 95% of this benchmark in theory of mind. Now in the paper, we have an example about uh, using GPT-4 to achieve harmony. Um, we've all been in the situation, a holiday gathering at our house, Republican uncle or aunt, and a Democrat mom or dad, and could be vice versa, of course, who always get into fights over politics. Neither of them got the COVID-19 vaccine, but for very different reasons. Uncle was upset for some reasons, decided, no, 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 mom believes it's dangerous and doesn't like non-natural products in her body. And his query, this is actually the prompt you're looking at right now. This is the prompt to GPT-4. He wants to convince both of them to get the vaccine while at the same time avoiding an argument. 
and I'm not going to go through the details. You can read about the, how this all goes in the paper. But we've since applied facilitation skills even to helping moderate a debate between someone who's climate aware and concerned and someone who says, nah, not a big deal for National Academies workshop. So a theory of mind, if it really is there, and I think it is, provides a foundation for numerous applications, intent recognition, medicine, education, tailored summarizations, facilitating conversations. So let me talk a little bit about education right now, which is the focus of this group. I thought I'd share a few thoughts on education and on research. So a long-term dream, and I have very close colleagues, including one sitting right here in the front row, has been a leader on, is building intelligent tutoring systems. How do you build computers to provide highly personalized, adaptive guidance to learners? How do you custom tailor content, pace, style of instruction? And then folks working in this space often call out, I want to generate content and exercises, I want to assess understanding at any moment, I want to diagnose errors and tailor help, I want to control pace and precision, I want to shift from abstract to concrete when needed. I want to have an ongoing engagement with the student. Now, now uh, Christina Canati, I worked with um, uh, Abby Gertner and, uh, and Kurt Van Lane, and you'll be hearing from her tomorrow in more detail. This is a picture from a, a paper about building knowledge about kinematics and using that in an intelligent tutoring system. But more generally, if you look at what the system, this, this knowledge base might sit inside of, there's a domain model like this, a learner model, teaching model, expertise, pedagogy, and interaction design. Um, I picked this picture because Christina was here, it's going to be here, but there are other wire mesh frames that are much more complicated, <laughs> so all sorts of arrows and nodes about what you need to put together to build a traditional intelligent tutoring systems. They've been hard to update, hard to iterate on, hard to do clinical trials or teaching trials and then updating them because they're just so big and unwieldy. The large scale language models are canalizing in how they might be used as a component of tutoring systems and enable more flexible exploration, say via experimentation with prompting versus efforts required for custom tailored software development. Now, on some general capabilities, we did explorations as part of early testing of the capabilities of GPT-4 with education and learning challenges. We, in part, were working um, with folks from Khan Academy and other places. Um, but we wanted to see, well, how might this work in different domains? We looked at some, you know, sort of high school math, um, middle school math, uh, physics lectures, the medical education area. Um, um, I'm going to show you a few snippets now. So I think it's important to see these snippets. They're all pulled out of larger sessions. Some of them are published on the web right now. Uh, these are examples, and we hope to see people in this room and other colleagues doing deep dives into studies of these capabilities. You'll see some, um, we'll call them sparks or glimmers right now. Pace and precision. Um, I fed the whole, a whole chapter almost of Feynman lectures on physics on electricity and magnetism into, chat, into GPT-4. And at some point, it's a, it's a big session. You can, we can make, make this available here. I said, well, can you, the student said, can you explain this more to you? I find it confusing. What does F equals Q paren E plus V times V mean? And the student said, you know, really beautiful. This is the first part of its discussion here. I mean, it's even courteous to the student. Let me explain this in more detail. Let me first go through vector notation and operations. First, let's recall the meaning of symbols. I mean, to me, a system trained on predicting the next token, building representations that have this capability is both mysterious and mind-blowing. This is part of a session with a student on calculus. Can you explain this to me more slowly and clearly? And this is about integration. Um, it does a really you know, nice, kind job of explaining integration. Now, we also explored the ability of systems to construct exercises, to diagnose errors and tailor help. Here's a little piece of a snippet. GPT-4 says, now try this challenge. Find the integral. Student goes a little slower. <laughs> and look at this. That is almost correct. But you forgot to add the constant of integration at the end. By the way, I wasn't 
trying to get an arrow when I put this in my hand. That was, that was me. I said, oops, oops. System said, you know, you know, that was me saying, you know, I forgot about the constant. And GPT-4 said, I'm glad you learned from your mistakes. The constant is important. <laughs> Now, in medicine, we have so many fun examples and so intriguing. Uh, I've, I've uh, shown some of these to the Stanford Medical School at the Stanford Grand Rounds for Internal Medicine. Um, these are beautiful, elegant questions. I went through them myself when I did my MD-PhD years ago at Stanford. Um, studied for weeks for these exams, by the way. Step one is the first after two years of medical education. Um, why might the student have selected malacoplakia? It was the wrong answer. What findings in the case may have brought that to mind? Can you share reflections on the student's reasoning? So the system basically is saying, well, I can't exactly know the process. Let me give you some insights here. These factors may have contributed. The presence of blood in the urine is a common symptom. The student might have focused on this and considered malaplakia a potential cause without taking into consideration the likelihoods, which is a common problem in preclinical medicine. Differential diagnosis. In the process of generating a list of diseases by likelihood, medical students are often taught to consider a wide range of possibilities, including rare conditions. You know, in medical school, they always said to the medical students, put your ear in the ground. What do you hear? Those aren't zebras, they're horses. Stop thinking about rare conditions. So the system sort of has <laughs> to have learned that. Uh, knowledge gaps. Um, you know, maybe just uh, don't know enough. And I thought this was interesting, focus, focus on lab results. The student may have been drawn to a patient's abnormal lab results, and, the, and it goes to why this might have confused the student. And it goes on into summary, summarizing, again, theory of mind of the state of knowledge of the student in this case. Here's another one. Uh, this continuing on. I said, well, let's, 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 we were imagining this system as in a tutoring system for doctors someday, medical, young doctors. Please explain to the student with care and understanding what she may have thought, but what the more likely diagnosis is and why, with the schistosomiasis. Dear student. <laughs> um, it's, it's very kind. And it's, it, it goes through some of the possible reasoning and it tries to explain the actual answer. You can imagine this, this kind of general power being harnessed in future tutoring systems. A uh, couple more examples I'll give you before moving on. Uh, and this gets into a more complicated session that we published online as part of what we call the AI anthology. You can look it up, the whole session. This was a student who the initial prompt was, hey, I'm a senior in high school and I know quantum, I just took a quantum physics class. What the heck is quantum, chem uh, quantum computing? I want to understand it better. And so, you know, so in, all, in, in the session at some point, the student said, I want to understand, uh, to better understand that. And the system basically gives an analogy. It gives an analogy. It says, well, you might help. Here's an analogy. And it gives a, and it kept on giving more and more analogies just to make things concrete for the student. And I found this quite interesting uh, sort of at the level of metacognition and pedagogy. I just paused and I said, hi, I'm an I'm a instructor. Why is com quantum computing difficult for people to understand? Uh, and so it's a much longer treatise he comes out of the system here. Look, it involves concepts and operations that are very different from the ones people are used to. Um, and it went through some examples. Then I said, well, hey, take these assessments of the difficulty of understanding these uh, set of specific concepts and reteach them to me. And the system said, you know, here's what, first it went through what it was going to do. It said, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to use more examples and visualizations. Um, it started with the idea of a qubit, and it started pick, putting up in, in ASCII pictures and visualizations. So the prospect that a system could actually go so far as to reason about what's hard for humans, back up, slow down, understand concreteness, examples, um, visualizations, to me, again, is pretty interesting. Now, people trying to build systems with these base, this pulsing heart of a system, maybe we'll call it GPT-4, don't get a lot out of it. It's, 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 it's a, it you can't assume that this is the end game. It's, a, it's kind of like substrate or a core um, uh, component. But if you think about 
what we need to do is we need to integrate time and memory and personalization into these systems. How do we generate an understanding of errors and corrections over time, competency over time, pointing the student to new exercises, test skills. So we need to think deeply as the, as the tutoring community on control logic, prompt formulation, long-term memory of these systems. Um, uh, unless there's some huge breakthrough and GPT-5 can do this all for us, which I don't expect. Talk about research and discovery now. Um, this is another interesting uh, area. Um, I see, I see uh, Ornacioni in, in the front row here. Uh, he and I worked with lead author Tom Hope and other colleagues on a paper that was on the front cover of uh, CACM in August, uh, reviewing po the prospects of what we might do to harness AI to assist scientists with scientific discovery. We call it multiple ways that AI systems could augment and extend the abilities of humans. Now, since gaining access to GPT-4, which came um, after writing this paper, um, we've been exploring its power uh, to perform some of the tasks that we actually call out in the paper. So one pretty impressive direction on the kind of the future of science and having like an AI co-pilot for science is I think captured by Code Interpreter from OpenAI. Now it's called Advanced Data Analytics, I think. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, interesting system that, that does multi-step analysis and dialogue and a call, it writes code, it asks for, it will show work. Let me show you an example of one that I ran just before coming here, after I got on the plane. I, I loaded in, you can load in data sets, I loaded in a big data set of data on temperature throughout the, the, the world and predictions of future temperatures by year. And I said, I'd like to better understand this data about global warming. Can you show me the changes in the average temperature changes 50 years from now? And what parts of the Earth will be most affected? Certainly, very courteous. The system basically um, uh, gets ready here. And then I said, well, I'm, I'm actually interested in changes in the average, tempers, average temperatures for the summers in the Northern Hemisphere based in a starting point of today. I want to see a map colored by where the changes are the greatest. How about making those areas redder appearing. Understood? It's kind of cool when the system breaks things down step by step for you. It's a longer list of what it's going to do. You can, but here, boom, projected change from a big data set that had all sorts of columns in it. Projected change in summer temperatures, 20, 40, 59 versus 1996, 2005. And it, it, it tells you the scenario and so on. Now, um, I want to ask a question. Um, uh, oh, on the system here, it's summarizing here, it's, it's, it's talking about what, what we can expect in North America, Europe, and Asia, and asks if I'd like to explore further or consider other emission scenarios. I just said, well, show me a close-up of the Korean Peninsula. Here's a close-up view of the Korean Peninsula. Both North and South Korea are projected to experience increases in summer temperatures with deeper shades of red indicating larger increases. I found it interesting that um, I can't really see it on this display as well, but yeah, you can see it on the big screen that, that North Korea will experience warmer temperatures. I, we just wouldn't have known from this gigantic uh, database. Are there estimates about the implications of this kind of warming on animal populations? If the researcher wants to learn more, and it's a long, a long discourse about what might be expected on animal populations in the region and, or any region we're interested in in the world. Now, we've also explored the ability of the model to critique research studies. This uh, example is online on the AI anthology. Now, one of these explorations, I, I input a whole paper that was just published in Nature on an analysis providing a hypothesis about why methane levels in the atmosphere were atypically high during the height of the pandemic. Now, I'm not going to show you the whole the interaction that's on the web, but here are the questions I asked the system about the paper. What are the key weaknesses of the study? and how can the work be strengthened? If we assume that the author's hypothesis is incorrect, they had an interesting set of hypotheses, what else might be going on to explain this? You know, why people were confused, why with less transportation, you had more methane in the atmosphere during the height of the pandemic? And then how might each hypothesis be studied? Then I wanted to know, did these authors overlook, overlook one or more important, potentially relevant, modeling methodologies 
or tools that could have helped their study? And if so, what were they? Now, the system at one point told me about, no, they didn't use Bayesian hierarchical modeling, BHM. I'm surprised, especially for the atmospheric 3D inversion part. Now, it's a very te you know, technical response. And I said, well, I mean, let's say I believe you. What would I do? I want to learn about this methodology. I was one of the authors, in fact. I'll play that role for now. Help teach me this methodology. The system went ahead and did that with pointers and so on. And then I wanted a system to really think out of the box. What are directions for follow-on studies of the challenges with methane sources, levels, and climate? And you can read about this on AI Anthology if you just search on that, that phrase. Now, let me end my brief power about the brief ref reflection on um, the capability of large language models in scientific discovery with a case study I recently did in collaboration with physicist and Nobel laureate Saul Perlmutter at UC Berkeley, and some of his physicist colleagues. <coughs> Relatively recently, um, a new form of matter called quasi-crystals was proposed and then discovered. These are crystals with um, aperiodic patterns in them, um, looking more or less like, like more complex than you'd, think in a, you'd see in a crystal. One type of quasi-crystal has been found in a meteorite and it's been thought to only occur through extraterrestrial processes. And we engaged with one of the main contributors on the science of quasi-crystals. We asked GPT-4, this was a question that he had, help us think about ways these special crystals might be created on Earth. The system just basically asked this question. Any thoughts? The system said, Consider lightning strikes on bauxite mines. He said, whoa. And this was very intriguing. And not just that, the system said, and here, we, here are places you should go look, where there's bauxite mines and lots of lightning. So the fact that um, an idea that had not occurred to physicists um, was potentially promoting science in a new way, and these are the the discoverers of quasi-crystals, the best people in the field that have been thinking about this for as long as we've known the concept quasi-crystals, first defined by mathematicians. Now, before ending, I want to just reflect briefly about potential costs and risks. It's not all on the upside. I don't want to sound too blown away and not like we're thinking deeply, and we do. AI, like any powerful technology, comes with benefits and and risks to people and society. And we need to invest creative efforts on addressing and mitigating these risks via technology, policy, and law. For example, new powers available via facial recognition technologies can lead to new intrusions into people's privacy. And governments can harness these and other AI technologies for mass surveillance that can encroach on democratic freedoms and broader human rights. Challenges have been noted with the fairness of inferences and recommendations made by our AI algorithms as they amplify and extend societal biases drawn from the data that they're trained on. This is an earlier version of Dolly 2, revealing gender biases. A physician with a patient, what about a nurse with a patient? Isn't that interesting? And then there's the challenge of generative AI methods being used for persuasion fraud, impersonation, and manipulation. Deep fakes have grown into a worldwide phenomenon over the past five years, and we're seeing an acceleration in these uses by bad actors, uh, malevolent nation states, uh, and um, even commercial entities. It's, it's easier than ever for bad actors to produce persuasive and manipulative fabrications, such as generating images to bolster a decades-old conspiracy theory that the landing on the moon was staged. I use three different, we use three different systems for this. So there are numerous other challenges as well. I just wanted to just touch space. That we, I mean, a, a, a just to be to, to full disclosure, a talk on that last couple slides, three slides, would, would be an hour just to get going. Um, include longer term challenges include catastrophic outcomes that worry some people, like bio security, bio threats coming via malicious uses of the power of AI in protein design. We're having a meeting, actually, at University of Washington 
uh, in uh, this next week, um, a workshop that uh, I've been uh, working, co-organizing um, on this topic that's bringing biologists together with concerns. So it's gonna take a cross-sectoral approach with the participation of industry, self-regulation, best practices, academia, governments, laws and regulations, sector-specific coalitions, societies, standards bodies, safety organizations, and I think eventually multinational understandings, coordination, and treaties, which people are starting to think about and gather about. There's actually a, a meeting in the UK coming up in, um, soon in December on, that will include this, focus on this topic, among others. So anyway, moving forward, great promise for accelerating progress in education, medicine and the sciences, and many other areas. We need to lean in creatively to guide innovations toward human flourishment. And this will take continued investments in understanding and addressing societal implications, failures, surprises, and abuses. But overall, if you didn't figure it out, even though I've been dipping more than a toe into the concerns, I'm very optimistic about where things are going. I think we will come to manage the risks of AI and we'll be able to leverage AI advances for humanity. And I'll stop there, thanks. 네, 자 슬라이드에 질문이 꽤 올라왔는데요. 시간 관계상 한두 질문만 받아보도록 하겠습니다. Now we have a Q&A session. 자 질문 한번 올려주시겠습니까? 네. 네, 먼저 상단의 질문 먼저 진행을 해보겠습니다. Do I pick? Oh, I pick. Okay. Um. Okay, well, we'll take the first one here. Is there the most important reason why we humans have to keep developing AI technology, although there are many ways for AI to be used in bad manners? Um, the way I view that question is, should we stop being scientists and stop our curiosity and stop pursuing knowledge? I think uh, Isaac Asimov had a beautiful quote. He said, whenever something was confusing or dangerous, he felt like it was his responsibility and for humanity to better study, to learn how to guide and control those technologies, not to hide from them or bottle them up in some odd way. I think we will, and we're doing a good job of this. We have, in fact, it's very inspirational to see how many people are interested in this topic now, universities and in, in, in industry and in government. Um, the White House OSTP, I'm very involved with the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, PCAST, there's, it, there's engagement in so many levels. I think we will do a good job of guiding the technology. Like any powerful technology in the past, it's gonna be hard to say, just don't look or stop somehow. I think we have to let humanity do its thing with curiosity, science, and understanding, and there's no way to stop that, really. Oh, well, um, on, on, on the question about AI technology and medicine to solve major illnesses, I think we're going to be, we're going into a period of time where we will be surprised by how fast things go in our ability to address these long-term acute and chronic illnesses and even, uh, you know, sort of normal aging uh, to, to find new trajectories to better health and well-being. I mean, I just visited um, David Baker's lab. We, we collaborate very closely with him at the University of Washington. He does protein design and he's using Dolly style methods, these diffusion modeling methods to now generate beautiful targets or, or target proteins for uh, targets in disease processes. And one group that I met with, what are you working on? Alzheimer's. We're gonna, we're gonna basically, we're gonna bind that, that beta amyloid protein. We think we can do it. So I, I think we'll be surprised how um, powerful these methods will be and we're just at the cusp of where things are going. And I know Daphne Kohler will be here tomorrow, maybe talking about Coursera and education. If she does, ask her about where she's going with in situ, her startup. AI technology itself has undergone continuous advancement and development over the past few decades. Well, looking at Oren and others, it's not been really, it's been plateaued and, and it has bumps and, you know, so it's, Continuous is optimistic, but we're moving pretty quickly now in some ways. Um, is there any particular reason why app AI applications for better education have become more important or feasible at this moment? I don't know, I'm looking at Christina Canati, right? 
she's been working on this for many moments, not just this moment. So we've had uh, intelligent tutoring um, systems people and educational experts and psychologists working on various computational algorithms to um, address challenges and opportunities in education for many decades. I'm happy that we're focusing on that topic here, now, AI and education, because I think just like in biomedicine, we're in for an interesting time of incredible opportunities um, and surprises. So thanks, everybody. Okay, we wrap it up here. Thank you so much. 네, 대단히 감사합니다. 자, 오늘 발표해 주신 에리 호르비츠님 유익한 강의 감사드립니다. Thank you.